Hello explorers and welcome to another video. Today we're going to talk about Ceph and maintenance. And we're going to go through changing IPs of monitors, removing a cache, and handling large deletions of objects. I'm excited to tell you that I partnered up with Code Combat to bring your kid a learning opportunity. Back in my day, there was no one that could tutor me. I knew more than the teachers and I had to put in the work because there was no other option. Unlock your child's coding potential with Code Combat's live online classes. The classes are led by experts who make learning an exciting and rewarding experience. With their help, your child will work through coding challenges and feel proud of their accomplishments. Personal attention and a structured curriculum will help your child become a confident coder. I always said that I hope that you learned something today and now your kid can. Follow the link in the description and enter the promo code EXPLORER10 at checkout for a 10% discount and all subscriptions have a 30-day money-back guarantee. And a Ceph cluster is a bunch of objects in an object storage that is handled uh, over a bunch of different hard drives. And the whole system is built in a way where you talk to a monitor and the monitor keeps track of where all the resources are. So if you are connecting to a file system, you talk to a monitor and say, I want to connect. And it will actually give you information of the MDS and the different ODSs that has the files. And if you want to do object storage, that is um, with S3, then that is connected to a monitor and will be handled there. And the same goes for when you are creating images in your Ceph cluster. So the monitors are a central part of the cluster. And when I read up on how to change the IP of a monitor, it pretty much said, you don't do that. And that, that was a little bit discouraging for in our case, we had the problem that we had an office network where all the clients in the office were connected and our Ceph cluster were running on that network, which was not the safest way of actually running the cluster. If we needed to move it to a different building, then it will not work because the same networks were not set up in both places. And yeah, there was a bunch of problems with it. So we needed to move the actual public side of the Ceph cluster to a totally different network. And that is a huge effort, huge thing. So if we switch over to my screen here, so this is my setup as home. So here we have a bunch of initial members, no three, four, five. These are the monitors that I'm using at home. They have a couple of IPs and you can also define ports for the version one and the version two protocols. So the version one has the port of six, seven, eight, nine. And the version two of the protocol has 3300. So you can set up different ports here if you want to use that. And then you have the public network. You can have a cluster network as well. And in other, our case, we had a cluster network that had the right IP range, but the public network was incorrect. So what did I do then? Well, I actually had to create more monitors and remove the old ones. So what I did was that I created three totally new monitors. I had six monitors. And running a uh, cluster with six monitors is not the best. You need to actually have um, an unequal number of them. And I don't think you actually should create them <laughs> as I did and have them running as six. I think you should just create two and then remove one, create one. So you actually have a balance of what is actually in the uh, quorum. But I created three new, st stopped one of the old ones, and then had five running. And that seemed to work, and we didn't have any big split in our network and a lot huge problem, but that could have been a problem. So I, I would, if I do this not some other time, create two new and run five for a while and then switch over uh, gradually. So what I did, I pretty much added a couple of more IPs in this list, uh, which were the new IPs on the new network. And you can also have a comma separated list of public networks. So I just added another network to public networks. So that was how I set up two, three more monitors then I had to go through each host and do the same configuration and restart all the services. So all the OSDs were on the right networks, 
all the MDSs, all the Rados gateways were on the right network and so on. So I had to go through a bunch of these different services and restart them to be on the right network. Then I had to go through all the clients that were connected to the file system and reconfigure them so they were on the right network. So all the clients had to be, re, uh, be changed the mount points and remounted. But the funny part with clients is that they actually connect to a monitor and fetch the list of the available monitors and then connect to one of the available ones. So maybe all the clients didn't need to be uh, reconnected, but as I wanted them to ensure that they always connected to the new network, I changed the configuration and reconnected them. And then after that, I had to go through Grafana, Prometheus, Node Exporter and Alert Manager because those were also on this network and needed to be moved to the new network. So that was a bunch of work on those as well. The Rados gateways also needed to move to the new network. And in our case, we also had a load balancer in front of it. So that needed to be reconfigured so the new nodes were coming to the right place. So there were a bunch of configuration changes to go over to the new uh, monitors. And when everything was done, all the clients were fixed. And this was work over multiple months because all of the clients were some, not everything was set up by me. So I actually had to um, maintain a list and handle it together with my uh, colleagues. But when everything was configured, we were able to shut down the old monitors and remove them. So if you're going to do this switch, you will create new monitors, remove the old ones. That's the only way in order to move over gradually and then reconfigure everything. If you're running Ceph admin, maybe you can just deploy new ones there with a new IP and a new range, but you, in that case, need to actually specify exactly where your public network is and uh, then it will select um, IPs for you. So it's a little bit more involved, but maybe you don't need to reconfigure the whole network. So you, you gain a bunch of things there, but you lose a bit of control. Very similar to everything else in the Ceph cluster. Next up, when we had done this uh, change, we also had the problem of our file system. And this is a legacy that I created, which were not good. And I, I, I know that I mentioned on this channel that the cache is not deprecated. It doesn't say anywhere that it's deprecated. Only Red Hat has mentioned it somewhere. And now I, when I was on Cephalicon, I got the very clear notice that this is deprecated. And when I tried to figure out how to actually work with the cache, I realized that we had set it up incorrectly and it was not working optimally, not working good, which was a really bad situation because cache is built in a way where you should say this cache tiering. You should actually have a max size of it. You need to set that max size of it or else in our case where we had a bunch of hard drives, we could grow it indefinitely, which it had done. And we had used it in a file system for mainly caching material. So we had actually written to the cache, removed from the cache, written to the cache, removed from the cache over multiple years, which meant that we had a bunch of objects in there. And because it didn't reach 40% uh, of the actual total size of the cache, it didn't have any hurry of actually writing it back to backend storage. So all these read and write operations were only held in the cache and never written to the backend storage, or some of them were, but not all of them. So what I needed to do was actually either set this 40% where it actually sets the dirty flag on the object to zero, and then the uh, cluster will work really hard in order to remove objects. And we realized that with the load we had on the cluster, that would never fly. 
So what I actually did was that I gradually changed the total size or the max allowed size of the cache to be uh, smaller and smaller. And we started with about 500 million objects in the cache. And then I gradually moved it down to zero. So we actually removed all the objects in the cache. And then we disconnected the caching tier. And uh, I think we had about a million objects left when we disconnected the caching tier. And then it wrote the last part of the objects to uh, the backend storage. So we were pretty safe that we had removed the cache and been able to remove all the objects. If you want, I can uh, create a tutorial where I actually show all the commands for that. Uh, but I think this is a very niche subject that I hope not many people actually run into. But that was what we had to do in order to remove our cache. And when we were totally removed, it said, okay, now we need to shrink the cache because it had, I think, uh, 556 uh, placement groups. And it realized that this is too much because this, and the cache also uh, locked it up. So it couldn't change size when the cache was enabled. So only when you had these pools in separated, it could actually change size of them. So when it tried to change size, it crashed over and over again um, and didn't really work. And it was crashing on the last part of it because it took too long time. We got timeouts in the monitors and on the OSDs and so on. So we had a really bad time there. So I had to turn off the, um, the rebalancing for a while. And then I realized after running all of the internet, and trying to figure out what the problem was that the database of the Ceph nodes were so um, defragmented or fragmented so we had to actually compact them. So what you can do is run this command Ceph tell OSD compact and you either say I want to run this on let's see OSD zero then it will only compact that one or if you run star, it will run them in sequence and go through all your OSDs and compact the database. And if you have removed a lot of database objects where you get fragmentations, this is a really good command to run. And other than that, I just had this uh, out of scale status where I could look into the current status of the uh, the uh, cluster and see which were moving up and down. And here I could also see that the target ratio, which is something that you can set, you can say, this is my target ratio, this is what I want you to keep track on, that was set to one on the file system, which was totally wrong because we have moved most of the data over to the object storage so I had to remove that and then it started to move more objects. And I was a little bit scared of that large movement because it was so many objects and so, so a lot of data. But after compacting the databases, we didn't notice that there were any problems with the actual moving of data. So the main problem was to handle a really fragmented database and figuring out where the objects actually should be and moving them around in this fragmented data source. So that is also something that I have learned during this process. And I hope that some of these tips and tricks is something that you have learned now and could use in your maintenance of your cluster. I hope that you like this video, give it a like, share it with your friends and colleagues. If you have any comments or suggestions, leave them down in the comment section down below. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. And I really hope to see you in the next video.